be embarrassed, but it's okay. <laughs> Good afternoon, brothers and sisters. How are you doing? Good. So, um, I'm going to do a couple of things, um, and then that'll be it. Um, I'm going to share an a cappella with you. Um, then I'm going to, you know, open up about what I think that means. I want to talk a little bit about education. You know, in terms of preparing our young people for the 21st century, for the world they have to exist in. Globally, we have some challenges of education. I'll, I'll give a preamble before I do the acapella and go into it. I was in Zimbabwe just a couple of weeks ago. And it's interesting looking, I've been in Nigeria, I've been in the States, I've taught in many different parts of the globe. Um, and it's interesting looking at how the different challenges manifest in different places with regards to a Pan-African education in particular. So for example, in the schools I visited in Zimbabwe where I lectured and I taught, they don't have the behavioural challenges that we have. Yes, sir. The kids listen. That's not a problem. Kids are quiet. Kids are quiet. And believe it or not, as much as uh, a lot of our, my older, my older, um, the elders in my family and many of the Caribbean families would say the youth need a beating. Believe it or not, it, it, it is a night in Zimbabwe. They love their teachers. Like they hug their teachers at the end of the day. Unlike here, where if you you know hug a student, you might get done for sex offence because we got such a problem with child abuse in this country that you can't even show an aff affection to a child in your care. In Zimbabwe that wasn't the issue, so behaviour wasn't a problem. Literacy is not one of the problems. A lot of people don't know, for all Zimbabwe's challenges, they have one of the highest female literacies in the world. Yeah, sure. Not in Africa, 98% female literacy. I'm not being romantic here, and this is one of the things I think in a safe space like this we need to not do, is be romantic. We can be self-critical and still be self-loving. We don't need to run to white people's media and offer up those criticisms because we know what the agenda is. Yeah. But in a safe space like this, we can be self-critical and still be self-loving. So the challenge wasn't behaviour there. But what I have noticed all across the continent, more so than here, is the access to good Pan-African books, which are ridiculously expensive even here. Yeah. So you can imagine what they cost in the continent. Access to those curricula and the colonial framework of a British education system in Nigeria, in, well, in Mali it was French, in Zimbabwe, I haven't been to Ghana. Right? That, that legacy is still very much there, and there's still actually this uh, admiration in many ways for a British education system where you can go to the main university in Harare and you can have more, probably everyone in here has got more books about African history than they have in their university library, which is shocking. Shocking. Now, what can we offer up in exchange in that way? Those of us that have access here, why are we not sending books back? Why are we not making that part of... Because I think sometimes we forget how much of a two-way dialogue it is. We forget that Garvey never set foot on the continent but inspired it, or part of it was part of an inspiration for an entire process that is part of why we're here today. So I think that challenge is there, whereas here, of course, the challenges are completely different. Here, behaviour is the problem. Literacy is the problem. Structural white supremacy is the problem. You know, so we have a whole different set of challenges that are functional to maintain in this system, because believe it or not, if black people globally were educated properly, and by properly I mean educated to serve their individual and then group self-interest, which is what every other group of people do, you couldn't have the kind of initiatives we're talking about today. You couldn't have the global exploitation of black people. You couldn't have as many black billionaires and hundreds of millionaires that you have and still have this situation where Hollywood can continue to whiteify black history and we've got no answer. We've got no answer. The best we can produce is films about butlers and more films about slavery. Sla films about slavery it don't even include acts of resistance. We're just waiting for Brad Pitt to come and save us. Because miseducation means that many of our elites on the continent and externally don't even have the self-respect that once they are in a powerful position to do anything to serve themselves. And I'm not saying everyone's doing bad things. I'm sure many of our successful, extremely successful brothers and sisters undercover are funding this and funding that and doing much great work. So I'm not condemning a whole group of people. What I'm saying is functional miseducation, which is something I was a victim of growing up, which I'm going to talk about in this acapella and then unpack for you. Functional miseducation is an integral part of the world system full stop. Regardless of race, functional education even of white people in this country, which we don't look at. One of the things I think we, or one of the self-criticisms I would offer up, and one of the things for me that has been most revolutionary and most revealing, believe it or not, has been the study of European history. Why? Because I think sometimes we like to think that we're, we're in a particularly awful situation, which maybe we are. We like to think that we've been victims of a particularly awful process, which we have. But by studying the history of the people that colonised us, we're like, right, these people are just crazy. <laughs> and actually, and actually, in this country, it wasn't that long ago, we're in Manchester, Peterloo. Anyone heard of Peterloo? Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't that long ago that their military constabulary were hacking to death 15 unarmed protesters in this country. It wasn't that long ago at Tyburn, down in uh, Westminster, down at Marble Arch. So if you're ever on Marble Arch, you'll see a church on the corner, right by Hyde Park, called Tyburn. 
They used to hang poor people with it for stealing bread and milk and rich people's hats. I'm not talking about ancient history. So when you see that this country's friends with Saudi Arabia, you shouldn't be surprised. <laughs> Birds of a feather flock together, right? And so for me, actually studying that history and realizing how brutal Europe was to itself, it's not a way of saying, oh, we're all the same, all our struggles are the same, we're all unified. No, but it is a way of understanding the mentality, understanding imperialism and also and I don't mean this obviously in the way that racist idiots mean it when they say get over it, get over your victimhood or whatever it is nonsense they're talking about. Actually, it's therapeutic to understand, oh damn, these people are just crazy. <laughs> and they wouldn't have done it to anyone regardless. And that doesn't mean there are no other crazy people on the earth. Of course, I don't share these romantic notions that we were all kings and queens bogling and singing Kumbaya in Africa before my <laughs> white show. That wasn't the case. There's been, there's been oppressors for as long as there's been humans probably. The degree of oppression has changed. Mm, yeah, yeah. The scale of oppression has changed the particular brutality of Europe can be addressed without us pretending, like I said, that we were all just, you know, doing Buddhist prayer chants before Mighty Whitey set foot on the continent. So I think all of those things are challenged. I think even addressing some of those painful aspects. Black collaboration is an unavoidable part of this process. And it's not something we have to sit down and be like, what, what racist people try to do is they try to beat you up with it. Like the idea, because there's black collaborators, that that somehow excuses you lot and your madness. Mm. And, and what happens often is, I've seen this so many times, rather than coming back with just telling people to shut their F up, right? We actually try and explain away black collaboration. When the British were colonizing Ireland and starving millions of Irish people to death, were they not Irish collaborators? Yes. When the British colonized India and starved 30 million Indian people to death, which they did during their reign in India, were they not Indian collaborators? In fact, when the Moors were in Europe for 800 years, what kept the Moors in Europe for 800 years but white people fighting amongst each other? When we talk about what's going on in Israel and Palestine, no one says, oh, it's semite on semite violence, just ignore it. When we talk about what happened in the Nazi Holocaust, no one says, oh, it's white on white violence, just ignore it. 25 million Russians died in World War II. That's more than every single war fought in Africa since the end of World War II. So white people are in no position to be lecturing anyone about white on white or black on black violence. So I think we can do away with that, but recognizing the role in which collaborators play internally and externally is a very, very important part. And we'll never, ever get any genuine sense of liberation or any sense of progress without realizing the way in which you have some people that make compromises, that are genuine, but they make compromises. I think that's one thing. If we study our history, we can look at Toussaint Louverture, who for Jean-Jacques Dessalines made too many compromises with the French. But Toussaint Louverture was a genuine revolutionary. No question about it. He just made compromises because he had a difference of strategy. We can bring that right back up to today with the anti-apartheid struggle. Nelson Mandela made certain compromises. I don't think that is the same as being an out-and-out -out collaborator. And I see a very one-dimensional critique of Mandela sometimes. People who've never spent any time in prison getting out of their pram and cussing down Mandela like he's some nobody, I'm not in it. That doesn't, mean, that doesn't mean we can't be critical. No one is above criticism, not even Garvey, not even Malcolm. No one is above criticism, and obviously not little old us who are stood up here today. But there is a very, very, very big difference between what Mandela had to do and what Toussaint Lior, Toussaint Louverture had to do and what Blaise Compatri had to do, if we're talking about Burkina Faso. That's a collaborator, very big difference. Yeah, and I think understanding those dynamics is very, very important. Anyway, that was a little preamble that wasn't supposed to be a preamble. I want to share with you a, 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 an a cappella, talk a little bit about my personal journey. Not because I think my personal journey is particularly important, but because I think it offers a micro of the macro challenge, particularly for those of us that are educated in white societies. See, one of the things that's fascinating about teaching in the Caribbean or teaching in Africa, and I think that our people with the greatest of respect in those places don't even understand, and I don't mean this in a rude way. When I'm in Zimbabwe and I've, I lectured at university and I told people the first time I saw someone get chopped up, I was 12, it was in the barbershop. Now that wouldn't shock anyone in here because you know what England's really like. But they, some people point blank refuse to believe me. They said, no, that, that doesn't happen. The only reason they were kind of like, oh, maybe, was because it was the week after the London riots. I was in there in August 2011 as well. The only that, and these are kids who went to private school. Daddy drove them to school in a Lexus. They went to private school, they're now at university. I never went to university, I barely went to college. But because they believe in some sense, just as our grandparents believe, this is how well the colonial propaganda is working. They believe because they're born in Africa, that they're automatically more disadvantaged than I am. I was like, I never grew up with my dad. I grew up on benefits. First time I saw someone get chopped off, I was 12. Life is not all wonderful just because you live in the West. And actually, I think one of our key, and that doesn't mean we're saying that there are not more severe struggles often in quote-unquote third world countries, but there is the converse. There are forms of benefit that we don't understand. Living in a society where being black is just normal. Yeah. Yeah. All of you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. When I first went to Nigeria in 2006, it was just like, oh. yeah. and I wasn't ignorant of the problems. I could see the poverty, 
I could see the classism. I could see all of the problems that are there. But it's just like, oh, I don't have to explain myself all day every day. How amazing. And of course, if you're born into it, you don't, um, you don't even realise that that's what you have. Zimbabwe was particularly inspirational for me. I don't know how many people in here have been to Zimbabwe, but you won't see skin bleaching in Zimbabwe. If you've been your turn, you, you won't, you hardly even see perm. It's weird. This light skin worship, which is another sickness we have, right? I didn't really see it. People were just happy to be black. It was amazing, <laughs> right? And so, and so for all its problems, and I'm not uncritical of what's going on there, but again, you can be critical and, and, and be loving. And so I think there's a two-way dialogue that we're not sharing enough. I think one of our functions when living and working in the Caribbean or in West Africa, one of the things we need to engage in where we're losing ground, I've heard a lot of talk about NGOs, about charity work, about all of this stuff here. One thing I would say that I think is dangerous, that maybe we need to learn some infiltration techniques, right? Because all the people on the continent at the moment, and in the Caribbean, but mostly on the continent, are mostly, the only people they're hearing from at the moment are middle class white people. And what does that mean? That means even if that middle class white person isn't even being dishonest, because for them, England is wonderful. America is wonderful. So in a way, they're not even being dishonest about their own experience. But what does it mean? It reinforces the idea that we just need to make it to the West and everything to be wonderful. And then what happens? Brain drain. Doctors that could have been doctors in Nigeria come and live in Peckham and their youths get killed. They could have just stayed in Nigeria. And what's happening in my generation? So many people of my age go, oh, I'm done. I'm going back. People are not even from Gambia. Like, I'm moving to Gambia. Jamaicans are moving to Gambia. Right? People are saying, you know what? Actually, it's not all it's cracked up to be. But we do have a purpose here and a function here. It's not a coincidence that the Pan-African Conference occurred in the center of empire. And it's not a coincidence that we're back here in the center of empire. Because as much as America wants to big up itself and shout, this is the center of the empire. Don't ever forget that. As sophisticated as these people are, they don't need to go around shouting. It's like we just calmly own the whole world. There's a very good book on a, on a, on a, on a side note. It's called Who Owns the World? You should read the book. Because it looks at who the largest landowners in the world are. And of course, it's not the people you think it is. The largest landowners in the world is the British monarchy, still. Followed by the South. The Australian, her family were third or fourth. Sister Esther Stanford taught me this, by the way, in our reparations conference, so I may remember this, right? Do you know, who, this is just a complete aside, do you know whose who's family are third or fourth biggest landowners in the world? Nicole Kidman. I was shocked. They must have been the ones that done off all the Aborigines and own half of Australia. So, anyway. Like I said, I'm going to share an acapella with you, reflect a little bit, and then I'd like to actually offer a few provocations and open up for a bit of dialogue before we finish, because I think often when we're talking, if I'm talking somewhere like this, where I'm going to assume I'm preaching to the converted, there's no point in me coming and telling you things that you probably already know. So I'd rather, you know, I offer a little bit of my story, how I think that relates to our global challenges, offer a few provocations, and we end with a little bit of a back and forth. It doesn't have to be questions, it can be comments, it can be, but no lectures, though. <laughs> Let's just, let's just have a discussion. Okay, so, how was that is? Take one more sip of my tea. I'm just winding you up. Then. We can play and, and, still, and still have luck. Goes like this. Yes, I grew up an adult in a single parent family. Been through a little bit of tragedy. Yes, I was around drugs and violence before the day that I started secondary. That's part of it, not half of it. Get the picture, the rest ain't necessary. Growing up, got a little caught up but that ain't even half of my life. I was also given the knowledge of self that is all we actually need to survive. So if you saw me, age nine, reading Malcolm, just fine. Teachers still treated me stupid. Students that couldn't speak English to put me in groups with. And the irony is some of the first men to give me schooling, they were called gangsters. But I already explained that we know what the truth is. They used to say, don't be like me. Yeah, I got a name and don't on the street. Nighttime comes, I can't sleep. That's the part fake rappers don't speak. We don't hit the road because we're tugs. Don't come out the womb, want to sell drugs. If we got the right guidance and love, would we fight people just like us? How could I knock the hustle to get by? How do you think I ate as a child? Judge, no one done many things wrong. Just don't boast about it in songs, but listen to my older bars. I was just as confused as you probably are, but you grow when you learn. Travel and cut. One too many man, you know, get cut. One too many man that could have been doctors end up spending their whole life boxed up. You learn. If you study, it's all set out just to make them money. No cover. It's all about getting poor people to fight one another. So it's logical that us killing our brothers, dissing our mothers is right in line with the dominant philosophy of our time. But time is a cycle, not a line. Comes back around, you regain your mind, you be ready for the energy I challenge in my rhyme. Remedy the pedigree, the jeopardy in your mind when the world is... Leverage is a crime. So we can all fight with our brothers over crumbs. It's harder to fight the one who makes guns. 
We can all talk shit and get two dollars. Harder to be the one who seeks knowledge. If we understood economics, we know money's nothing. Think nothing of it. Money is a means to get wealth. Not the wealth itself and don't get confused far from Bro, all do you see me do I own But I won't hang walk around my neck I know from where that the diamonds came But I do literally own a library that definitely costs more than your chain And businesses and property Far from starving, I eat quite properly and I don't care I just said it for the kids You need to know you're not broke to listen You don't know an asset from a liability Because they've never been shown nor told the difference So we don't change situation Why well, the richest man in Britain is Asian and that's significant, not coincidence. Because when Asian communities build their businesses, it's not by flossing and going out shopping and giving out the culture for everyone's profit. Who runs Bollywood? Indian people. Who runs rap? So we shake our ass and dance as if racism just upped and vanished. <laughs> but has it? No, it's right on course. You're beating so bad, you're trained to ignore. Let me not just make sweeping statements. Give me a second. I'll explain it. For small amounts of non-violent drug possession, there's more black people in jail in America then there is for rape and armed robbery and murder, all put together. And you can say they're just locking up tugs, but imagine they're in prison every middle class kid that had ever held drugs. Mm. Oh, that's right, that'd be their kids. See, it's bigger than that. What is going on with this prison in America's private business? They get paid 50k per year per inmate by the state. Just wait, also legally are allowed to use their prison inmates as slaves, cheap slave labour for big corporations to come out of jail when they can't get a job. So when we celebrate going to jail, we are literally celebrating enslavement. Add to that, that the hood that you live in. Engineered social condition that we crime by design. Where do you think you get your nine? And you can say that they're just black, but I like to deal with facts. In the 1920s, you would have found in America, black towns or prospering centres of economics and education to make you proud. But some people, could have bet that the former slaves would not just lie down so the KKK and other hate groups burn those towns to the ground. Killing hundreds, if it ain't understood. You think you were always living in the hood, it's only been 50 years since they hung blacks and burned them and that was so cool. They were your past picnic baskets, even gave kids the day off school. Go see a lynching, have a picnic. It's fun to watch the little monkeys die. Then people act a little dysfunctional and we want to pretend that we don't know why. If your colour means you can be killed and you're powerless to get justice about it, is it difficult to figure out how you would then end up feeling about it? And I ain't excuses, I'm just dealing with the roots of abuses that make a reality where a generation of young men speak of ourselves as dirt, casually. That's America, this, Britain. Something similar, some different. In this country, the first enslaved were the working class. What's changed? Worse jobs, worse conditions, most tax that you quit a living. Yet they go to the pub on a Friday night and will fight with a guy, don't know what for. Won't fight with a guy in a suit and a tie who sends your kids to die in a war. They don't send the kids to the rich or the politicians, it's their kids. The poor British that they send to go and die in a foreign land. For these kids that you don't understand. You gotta say you are British and that lovely patriotism they feed you, but in reality you have more in common with immigrants than with your leaders, I know. Both sides of my family, black and white, a fed ghetto mentality, reality in the system. Poor people are dirt regardless of shame. But with that said, Let's not pretend for one second that everything is the same. Because when our grandparents came here to Britain, if you had a criminal record, you couldn't get in. When our grandparents came here to Britain, if you had a criminal record, you couldn't get in. They ain't protected from all of the stupid, stupid abuses they would be living. Kicked in the teeth, stabbed in the street, many times firebombed our houses, put feces through our letterbox, and of course the cops did so much about it. Daily, up to the 80s, people spitting in my pram because I was a coon baby. But of course, that has had no effect on why today we are crazy. And none of this was for any good reason. They were just dark and grieving. To ease the guilt now for all of this treatment, constant stereotypes are needed. So if I celebrate how big that my bricks start flipping, clips start sticking, chicks that I'm hitting, I'm playing my position, but if I teach a kid to be a mathematician, I'm messing with this because I'm how they're gonna fill a prison when materialism is no longer a religion. What do you think we got now in Britain? Just like America. Private prison. Prison for profit. So that means if your kids go jail, someone makes money off it. So keep environments that breed crime, build more jails at the same time, market badness to the kids in the rhymes, as long as rich kids ain't dying, it's fine. Get them to the point where some are so lost, they actually believe if they don't celebrate killing themselves off, that it's because they're soft. Was Malcolm soft? Was Marley soft? Tell me, was Marcus Garvey soft? Well, was Muhammad Ali soft? Nah, nah, I think not, but they want us to think that the role is cool, and being on role is all we can do. And we don't control the wholesale production, so who benefits from us moving the food? Or thinking there's no way out of road life, but Malcolm X used to hustle on the roadside. And Marcus Garvey organised more than six million people with no Facebook or Twitter. Why is it something we can't equal? Shh. One of my own homeboys did a 10 straight in the... Don't tell me that it's too hard. Who trains you to believe you're inferior? Your sung boat ever though in Nigeria are the remains of an ancient moat dug 1,000 years ago. It's 20 meters wide, 70 down. Round the remains of an ancient town that's 400 square miles around. 400 square miles around, but please, please don't believe me. It was a documentary on BBC, but we ain't studying history. Too busy watching MTV. And MTV said, wear platinum. I really want to go and wear platinum. And MTV said, pop magnums. I really want to go and pop magnum. If MTV said, drink prune juice, 
You will start hearing that in tune soon. Hey, today in the Paul McCarty is it now that's important what I got to say? Ho oh, and I drive a Mercedes, by the way, so everyone listen to what I got to say. Does that make you all happy? Ah, oh, but shh, my head's still nappy. Think for myself, so some mad at me. But on a mic ain't not one bad as me. All of this here's good for the rhymes. It puts us in the same place at the same time and it's clear to everybody I'm out of my mind. Some of these guys are running out of the rhymes. Clear to everybody. They just got ears. He's the guy that they just might fear. They don't want to get near, but they can't have a peer. Raw dear, I'm hard licking you just like beer. Front on the kids for another five years, but come to my shows and some criteria see it mean that much to him. It's a movement. I don't speak for myself, but a unit. Black, white, man, woman. Anyone who respects truth, we put in. These dudes are like no dinner, we're just pudding. Yeah, you're sweet, but no substance pudding. You can never ever be with a level on. Our songs get played out, them level on. We speak for the people properly, not for the old fat guys in offices. Anyway, that's enough kissing my own. Back to the more important task of being so shower that I got half the hood screaming, knowledge is power. And I ain't saying that I'll change rap back, but I do know this for a fact. Right now, there's you on your block with his hands on his face screwed up. Swear he don't care that he don't give a that he won't let nobody call his bluff, but the words go in. Open your chakras. Once that's happened, there is no going backwards. Stop to see what is really happening. Who the enemy should be attacking is. So read, 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 stuck on the block. Read, read, sitting in the box. Read, read, don't let them say what you can achieve. Because when people are enslaved, one of the first things they do is stop them reading. Because it is well understood that intelligent people will take their freedom. Because if we knew our power, we would understand we can't be held down if we knew our power. We would not elevate not one of these clowns if we knew our power. We wouldn't get arrogant when we get two pennies. If we knew our power, we would see what everybody sees that we're rich already. But never mind MCs, go run for your mummy. I'm hungry, I run for my tummy. That's enough. Back to worshipping money. I'm off. Back to the study. <laughs> and we're not supposed to blush. <laughs> no, thank you very much, brother, sister. I really appreciate it. So I'm going I'm to reflect a little bit on, like I said, my personal journey, how I think that relates to our larger challenge for those of us living in, quote-unquote, the West, educating our children properly. But what we can learn and what we can exchange then with the continent, with majority black nations like the Caribbean or Brazil. Most people don't know Brazil is a majority black nation. You'd never know that from looking at the marketing. But there are more Africans in Brazil than any country in Africa aside from Nigeria as I'm sure you will know. So for those who didn't pick it up in that, in that little a cappella I was offering, and this is not, uh, I'm gonna put this in historical context for you. So when we had the waves of immigration post World War II, no matter what the qualifications were of Caribbean people, we were not brought here to become doctors and lawyers and engineers and to do the jobs that necessarily some of us might have even been qualified to do. We were brought here to do menial manual labor to rebuild the country after the Queen's German cousins bombed it. That's what we were brought here to do, right? What did that mean to turn people? Because you know what we see a lot? I'm going to remark on this. This has actually just occurred to me looking at this picture. We see a lot of the older generation cussing the youth for how they dress and saying if they just dressed better, police wouldn't kill them. Well, look how these people were dressed. Yeah. Sharp as anything. Yeah. Did it make a difference? No. The rest of people in a business how a black person's dressed. It don't matter. You can put what suit ever. What, you could dress how you want. If they have the power to do to you what they have done, they will do it. So what did this mean? With this wave of immigration, as many of you, as you know, you had to have functional and structural injustice embedded into the way we were dealt with. We couldn't be brought here and be getting any big ideas that we were going to run the country or have a say in the way the country was run. This impacted on my father's generation in one particular practical way which relates to my life. So you had this thing many of you probably know about it called ESN, Educationally Subnormal. Yeah? So in the 70s and 80s, young Afro-Caribbean boys particularly, but sisters also, were labelled educationally subnormal, which is an offshoot of eugenics, we'll get into, we can't get into all that, that's another lecture for another day. How did this impact me? Well, by the time I was going to school, primary school, in the late 80s, you no longer had that particular category, but you had the same function. So at seven years old, I was very lucky, even though I didn't grow up with my dad, my dad was very supportive, very big on education as was my mum, as was my godfather, and both my dad and my godfather. You know they're that strapping black man you want to be like. <laughs> so because they were both into education, I never had, you know, it's a real thing. A lot of our uh, young brothers particularly, you know, if you watch a show like The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, the educated one is, I, don't, I, don't, I can't really swear because there's young kids in here, but the educated one is a fool, really. <laughs> He's the one no girls are interested in, he does some corny dance. You don't want to be like Carlton Banks. Yeah. yeah, you want to be like Will Smith. But what are they telling you? They're telling you that the guy who pays, in, pays attention in school and actually does well is a fool, and the guy who doesn't. And that's what's be, being marketed to young boys, particularly in a certain way. So it meant that this idea that education was almost effeminate, unmasculine, particularly for black men, is something that has been a very genius piece of marketing strategy from the white supremacist machine. That a continent that for tens of thousands of years was 
uh, among human preeminence of achievement in science and maths and architecture and all that, the descendants of that continent now associate big words and someone says, stop talking white. As if, you know, being intelligent is a monopoly of white people. So, what happened to me was, is a legacy of, of, of structural, because, see, it's important that we make the structural person. Because sometimes we have these big, big words like imperialism. If we're chatting to a youth on a level in school, you know, Marxist-Leninist ideology or Pan-Africanist ideology or whatever ideology ain't necessarily going to get it done. But if we can look at how does this affect you in your day-to-day -day reality. So at seven years old, I got put in a special needs group for kids that didn't speak English. But I had a GCSE read name. I had a high school. I'm not saying this to show off. This is a, a point. My teacher, white lady, was making it very clear to me that me being educated was threatening, was problematic. And let's think about it like this. She's a middle-class white woman. Brought up in a culture that teaches her ethnic exceptionalism. Teaches her white people are wonderful. They've invented everything ever since the dawn of humanity. Everything the Greeks didn't invent, the European Renaissance did. And then we did the rest in the 20th century. Now, of course, if that's your vision of world history, I mean, you're a bit of an idiot, <laughs> firstly. But secondly, if that, no, genuinely, if that's your vision of the way the world evolved, the way the whole human family evolved, that less than 10% of humanity invented everything, mm -hmm. you're not going to be very good at teaching people who don't look like you. Yeah. And what dilemma are you presented with? I went to a school in a very confusing area. I went to school in Camden in London. For those who don't know it, Camden is a strange area. Because yeah. you've got some of the richest people in the country living next to some of the poorest people, yeah. and you've got every ethnicity under the sun. Right? But we go to the same school. So I went to school with Tessa Jow's kids. I went to school with the head of Greenpeace's kids. And I also went to the school with my brethren on the block who was selling drugs for his dad at 11. So it was a very confusing place to go to school. What do you do as a teacher, as a teacher brought up in that way to believe those things, if the smartest kid in your class isn't the young white kid? It's the young brown boy who's on free school meals. You've got a choice. You either try and get the best out of that student, or you reinforce and reproduce the prejudice of your society. And sadly, luckily for me, I had a yo-yo between bad teachers and good teachers. But this particular teacher put me in a special needs group of kids that didn't speak English. Now, how you knew what she was doing was wrong, she never told my mum. So it wasn't like an official thing. It was like, oh, this guy's a bit too clever for his own good. Put him in a special needs group with kids that don't speak English, but you get hot chocolate and biscuits, you see. <laughs> now, when you give a seven-year-old hot chocolate and biscuits, I ain't running home to tell my mum anytime soon that I'm in the bad behaviour group, right? Because I, I want my hot chocolate and biscuits. In fact, I blame that teacher for why I got such a sweet tooth now. So, continues. I'm just going to give you a little catalogue of schooling, because we're talking about education, and many people in here who have children might be going through this right now. What do we do, right? In exchange. Now, it's very interesting because, of course, my mum's white. And this produced a very interesting dynamic in the white teachers. Because, of course, there's a different respect for whiteness, you know. Black woman goes to the school and it's like, crazy black woman, she's just imagining things. Yeah. White woman goes to the school, even if she's not from wealth, which my mum absolutely is not, it's still a, oh, ah, what do we do? And I remember the day, so someone came home and told my mum, they put your, your, your son in a special needs group, right? He's, he's in a group of kids that don't speak English. Now, that's great. It's f fantastic that the school provided for children who English isn't their first language. But clearly, that isn't, wasn't my language, right? <laughs> so my mum comes up to school, and my mum doesn't care. My mum will effing blind. She, she doesn't care. So she's just effing and blinding his teacher. And the teacher, the teacher also hit me, by the way. Uh, yeah, with, with a book. Yeah, she hit me with a ruler and with a book. Um, she thinks it's the 1964. Um, now, my mum comes up and goes mad at the teacher, and the teacher went, I, I, I admit to hitting him and to put him in the group, but it's not because, and she's looking at me, and she can't figure out what to call me. It's not because he's a, and she goes to say Cullen, and she remembers it's, it's 1990, she can't call me Cullen. Anymore. <laughs> and she goes, it's not because he's brown. Because she's looking at my mum like, I can't really call him black, I don't know what to do. Now, of course, now, my mum was different. My mum learned very early, and I, I kind of admired her for this. The racism she received from her own family and her own community. Well, like today, see, a lot of people today, a lot of mixed kids growing up today, think it was always fashionable to have little mixed race babies. Contrary to popular belief, it was not. And in the 80s, if you, if you were a white woman or man, but particularly woman, because that's what most of the mixing was, and you decided to have a baby with those folks, you basically had to accept that the only people that were going to chat to you to a certain degree, if you lived in an out, were going to be black people. And it's a weird thing about our community that sometimes I think sometimes we're too accepting it. If I'm honest with you, there's like almost, almost it creates a situation where if a white person enters a room and they don't receive red carpet, that, that becomes persecution. Black people ain't always nice to each other, so we don't always have to be nice to you. But that's an aside. So my mum learned very early, her dad basically disowned her, my mum's family is half Scottish, half English. What was interesting though, and this was what was fascinating to me as a kid, my Scottish family didn't give a, didn't give a damn. They were kind of like, well at least he's not English. I'm not saying that to be romantic, right? For those who know the history between England and Scotland, you know why, right? 
when I went to, they're from the Outer Hebrides, they're peat farmers. This is the fascinating thing about traveling on the continent. It's being mixed or being light-skinned. People assume you come from money, right? It's, we think whiteness and wealth are intimately related. My mum's family are peat farmers. Does anyone know what that is? That's something people stopped doing like 200 years ago. So they really are like peasants, like in a, in a genuine sense, right? So I went, I went to Scotland when I was young. I don't know why this, this matters, right? I only went once to visit them. And it was fascinating because my cousins actually had no idea why people were brown. She had no idea. They had no idea. Like, because they didn't have telly. It was like, there was like 800 people on Benbecula at the time. They genuinely had, like, they were like, what happened? Like, <laughs> explain to us how it, how it got like that. But the English, of course, indoctrinated as they were, my English granddad thoroughly into white supremacist ideology. My granddad was about as racist as it's possible for a, for a human being to be. So he kind of disowned my mum. And my mum learned very early that her children were going to be dealt with a particular way. And to be fair to her, she, along with the help of my godfather, who I told you about, uh, my godfather's family, a very politicised Guyanese family, really politically intelligent. Basically, they schooled my mum and was just let her know, this is what you're going to have to do. This is how... And so on that kindness, she was able, she sent us to Pan-African Saturday School, which I, I get it, it must be very difficult. As a white lady, you're like, there's certain stuff you're not going to be part of. Yeah. And I see this a lot with mixed kids where the white mum can't let go of the fact that, yo, you need to prepare your children to exist under white supremacy, but it also means it's going to create some tension. Yeah. And I see a very big challenge where a lot of the mixed kids think that being black is about being bad. So I'm going to be extra bad to prove my blackness. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. And I think maybe I went through that a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> right? So we come into uh, year four. I visit, these are just some significant schooling experiences that I think is important because, like I said, many of us may share them. And then how does it relate to teaching what we need to teach? I went to the National Portrait Gallery with my teacher in year four at primary school. Now there's a picture of William Wilberforce in the National Portrait Gallery. Everyone knows what's coming, right? <laughs> now, this teacher decides to take me aside. No one else. I wasn't the only black kid in the class. But I was one of those black kids. I was already... My, my, my Pan-African Saturday school was called the Winnie Mandela School. So you already know where it was coming from. It wasn't no soft thing. It was militant, right? So she pulls me aside. She says... She was Canadian. This is my worst attempt at a Canadian accent. She's like, Kingsley, this man, he stopped slavery. And I went, I'm seven, but I'm not stupid, right? So I went, miss, all by himself. Yeah. <laughs> really, really. Um, and she responded with yes. So she was obviously trying to impose on me that one white man was so powerful he just waved his magic anti-slavery wand, right, and set everybody free. Hooray! Now at this point I already knew who the Maroons were, I knew a little bit about the Haitian Revolution, so I knew she was chatting egg and fart, yeah? But what happens to the child that doesn't know that? Yeah? Once that's, once that's instilled at you at seven, who is it who said it's easier to build strong children than to fix broken adults? Was it Frederick? Frederick Douglass. Fantastic. So, Fantastic quote there, right? Mm -hmm. Now, what happens to all the children that don't know that history? And their teachers do a simple... That's aggressive. To teach a young black child, this one white man is so amazing. Yeah. He's basically God. He just waved a wand and all black people were free. And you lot did nothing. You just sat down and waited for Wilberforce to come along. Right? Go forward. I, and uh, what's interesting is the dynamic we never talk about. I've heard Dr. Umar talk about it, but many other people seem to be afraid to talk about it. The dynamic between middle-class white women and young black boys. Yeah. Yeah. We don't like to talk about that dynamic because white men are supposed to have done all the racism all by themselves. Yeah. And it's a very interesting thing, because actually most of my attention in school was actually women I was encountering. Yeah. So in secondary school, I had a, my form tutor. This is the last episode of my own education I, I, I'll give. But I had a form tutor. She was my main form tutor. She was also the head of history and the head of RE in our school. She was the head of RE, but she refused to teach anything about Islam, because to quote her, she didn't want bombs through her letterbox. <laughs> oh, it gets worse. Oh, it gets way worse. Oh, it gets way worse. That's, I'm just introducing you to what she was about. This is in my nice liberal arts school in Camden. It likes to think of itself as a nice liberal, yes, King. Nice, likes to think of itself as a nice liberal, great space where everyone can come and get along. A teacher told me in this school, a little aside, a white teacher by the way, told me that at the beginning of every year induction in the school, the school would look at the names of pupils who came in in year seven and make bets on who would finish school and who wouldn't, merely based off the surnames. So if Jermaine Williams comes into the school, they're like, he's not making it. If Harry Tomei comes in, they're like, he's making it. And they said 90% of the time they were correct. But anyway, this particular form tutor, we'd had a million arguments because my school, weirdly, even though it had all of that going on, there was a brother in there from the NOI who had an extracurricular African history class where he taught us, where we listened to this big narrated tape of the Haitian Revolution, where we studied some serious Pan-African stuff. So on the one hand, you had this school that was quite regressive. On the other hand, you had this extracurricular class that was radicalizing, whatever that means, because of course there's a non-radical norm and anything outside that is radical, right? Um, he was radicalizing us into a kind of black nationalist, Pan-Africanist ideology, right? Or educating us, I would prefer to say. So you had all of that going on, all those dynamics in the same school. This particular teacher, we've had a million arguments. I mean, she said things like, you can't look at all the bad they did in slavery because they built railways. 
Uh, I pointed out where the Nazis also built railways, but I doubt you'd say that, um, which obviously she wouldn't, because she'd lose her job. But this one particular day, and I rem I'll remember this forever, we were having an argument. She was arguing that the Nation of Islam and the KKK is essentially the same thing, except one's black and one's white. And that gets worse. That's, come on, that's, that's just the, that, the, the warm-up. So I said to her, miss, come on, that, that's a little bit far-fetched. Whatever you think of the NOI's opinions on racial evolution, they're not a terrorist group. They don't go around hanging white people from trees and you know, cutting their penises off and burning them at the stake and burning down white towns and all of those acts of mass terrorism that we know the KKK are responsible for. But what's more than that, this was a period in the 90s where the NOI had gone into a lot of African-American neighborhoods unarmed and they were policing a lot of neighborhoods. It was, it was even in mainstream news over here. They were kind of like, you know what? Whatever we want to say about these men, they're kind of doing some product. Like, you know that reluctant, I don't know if you remember in the 90s where there was that reluctant mainstream acknowledgement over here that, right, these men are kind of like serious. And obviously they're going into the hood unarmed and the men, them, the tugs are looking at them like, right, I can't really shoot a black man who looks that shot. <laughs> like, you just look too shocked to get shot. Because unlike racists, black people seem to care about appearance. <laughs> Anywho. So I say to her, miss, not only are they not a terrorist organization, they are doing lots of positive work, like stopping crime in black communities, right, policing them. And she turned around and said, the Ku Klux Klan stop crime by killing black people. <gasps> you didn't mishear me. You did not mishear me. What's the name? <laughs> <laughs> no, but more important than that, it wasn't about the individual teacher, it was about the school's yeah. reaction. Now it's funny, because anyone who knows me, you know, I've got a company, we do a little bit of educational work, we've probably been in 500 schools in this country. I've never been invited back to my secondary school. <laughs> and I'm, asked, I might, I'm wondering, I might be wrong. And I've never spoke about this before recently, like last couple of months, I was keeping this particular issue like, I, like, I don't really want to talk about this yet, it's not time, but last couple of months I've started talking about it, I spoke about it on my Twitter first and then a few lectures, right? Because it's an interesting thing where this, like I said, this liberal, progressive, and sometimes the liberal progressive people are worse. You sometimes, you just want a person who tells you to your face, I don't like you. You know, you all had a go, and then you know what? I can actually respect a person who knows history who says, listen, everyone else had a go at mass murder and rape and imperialism, and we were the best at it, so get over yourself. <laughs> There's a degree, not totally, but a degree of slight truth to that. If you're just like, listen, everyone else had an empire, and when it came to organizing mass murder, we were the best at it. Get over yourself. I can almost expect it respect to a degree a person who's just that unapologetic and just tells me to my face, this is what it is. Whereas the people are kind of, oh, love and peace and love and peace by William Wilberforce. I'm not in it. Right? Headmaster, you know? And the headmaster called me in his office one day and he sat me down and he done what liberals always do. He placated me. And he gave me a book about Martin Luther King. Because of course the answer to everything is Martin Luther King. And I, I'm not even dissing Dr. King. I've got of immense love for the, for the man's strength. But this idea even that we can be dictated to by white people who we should idolise. I don't idolise non-violence um, non as a political strategy. I respect that a person made that decision. I admire the courage it takes to stand in front of people while they're beating the living daylights out of you and your woman. I respect it, but I'm not gonna engage in it. If you slap my girlfriend in front of me, well, good luck to you. And I'm, not, I'm not saying that because I'm some kind of bad man. I'm just saying, I think they like to believe that of course all black people agreed with one strategy. It makes us easier, you know, we're all just one big unitary group, no. Garvey's organisation shot police officers and they kept kidnapped Ku Klux Klan members and whipped them. They don't want to tell you that part of the history. The Panthers were like, no, no, no. In fact, many of the, even the deacons around Dr King we know were armed. We know how people, black people voted in Louds County, where the original Black Panthers were formed. They went to the polling station with straps. Granny turned up, she put the magnum down, she casted her vote and she went back. <laughs> but we don't want to promote that side of the story. We'll, we'll give you Selma over and over again, over and over again. We're not going to make a film about, you know, black grandmothers taking guns to the polling station. That's a little bit dangerous, that image. So what do we do then, in terms of education, when our, when our young people are in a system where education doesn't only come from the school, it comes from music, yeah. particularly. Yeah. I was very lucky, you know, growing up in the kind of mid-90s, American hip-hop, believe it or not, as much as people want to cuss hip-hop, that was one of the main forces that kept us educated. Yes. Yes. You can say what you want, yes. but Wu-Tang, yes. Nas, yes. Erica Badu, or actually she's not totally hip-hop. But for me, actually, I grew up, luckily, kind of in the last era where there was a representation of black intelligence that I could relate to. Whether we like it or not, not all of our young people are going to relate to university professors, and that's okay. Because I doubt, as someone pointed out, I doubt Bill Gates <coughs> is particularly popular in high school. This is not unique to black people, you know, not everyone, like, not everyone um, understands or is engaged in, you know, that level of kind of academic discourse. So music became an incredible vehicle for translating particular truths or ideas and stuff like that. And so for me, when Wu-Tang came out, and for my whole era, it was a way that we could be intelligent, speak a certain way, be benevolent, without feeling like we were trying to be like the rich white kids. And so it was revolutionary in that sense. 
which the music industry understood. And so, of course, that narrative, there was a time when rap was just offensive to everyone. Rap would use any racial slur. Now you can only use one, and we don't know which one that is. Where before, when we were spreading the love, yeah, when it could, you could make a song called Polly Wanna Cracker, as well as, you know, songs with the word nigger every two minutes, right? You can could, you could have that broad spread of kind of, uh, of kind of, uh, what's the word? Of, I don't know, of racial offense, shall we say. You had dead press. But all of these groups are sort of deleted from hip hop, and so we don't have that voice so much. We have the internet, and we have people doing things, you know, and becoming successful in that manner. Even myself as an independent artist without the internet, I'd be struggling. I ain't gonna get on the radio. But I think we have to be sophisticated in how we manipulate the tools that are at hand. There was a brilliant documentary recently on the Beeb of all places. I don't know if you saw it, Britain's Forgotten Slave Owners. Yeah? yeah. yeah? It was about the compensation that British slave owners were paid at the end of slavery. Now, the thing is, what I, don't, I think we, we sometimes, and again, this is about being respectfully critical, even of myself. We sometimes, I don't think, can always work as well as we can on multiple layers and recognize that different people have different jobs. And this has been a historic conflict. Garvey and Du Bois, Martin and Malcolm. And still today, we have a similar scenario where actually two sets of people, two sets of ideologies or more, that maybe have similar shared aims, but we're disagreeing over religion. We're disagreeing because we're from different class backgrounds, different education. Whereas actually, we might have similar aims that we want to get done, so why don't we unify around those? And we can disagree. Because if we agree on everything, then we're just automatons, we're not people. Yeah. Why should I agree with everything you believe and you agree with everything I believe? And how does that impact on education? How do we resurrect the kind of Saturday school movement in a, in a kind of current climate that we have today, where there isn't that funding, where there isn't the cultural icon? See, in the late 80s, early 90s, for those who didn't grow up yes or are not of my age or older, we also had even in television, you had the Ron McCoy, you had Desmond's, and they were small. They might not, you know what they, you realize now how massive they were that they don't exist. You, this gaping hole in black television, where you realize, wow, oh, we had a little point where black people had started to gain a foothold in this country, because I think one of the things when we discuss Garvey, when we discuss the Pan-Africanist movement, one, one of the things we can gloss over very quickly is Garvey never said all black people should move back to Africa. Right. Some of us are useless and we should just stay where we are. Yeah. And, and some of us are useful and should stay where we are. Yeah. What we're talking about is a Pan-African trading network. What we're talking about is black people across the globe building a unitary power block to counter Europe and Asia. And that's not even necessarily beef. There might be cooperation. Who knows? In terms of particularly the emergence of Asia, there might be some form of economic cooperation. But it has to be from equality of power. Because there is no justice without power. People would like us to get up and beg for justice and ask for people to be nice. Unfortunately, that doesn't seem to me to be the way the world works. And it certainly isn't the way that European racialized power works. And how do we then, and what can we contribute in terms of education, getting our children, even just staying in school. We can cuss the school system all we want. But most countries in the world do not have free school. So just having access to free school is a privilege. What do we do with that then? How do we give our children the equipment to get through the racist school that they're going to have and come out the other end the same human beings? As one of my good friends, MK Asante, says, they have to take two sets of notes. They have to take the sets of notes they need to pass the test to get through. To have Because the, the bottom line is, if you drop out of school at 12, we know where you're headed. Private prison. We know where. We know what happens. You get expelled, you go unit, you go jail. That's the route. So whatever schools' faults are, we still need the schools at this present point until we have our own. And how do we use the Saturday schools? How do we resurrect that movement? How do we create alternative community schooling but still get the qualifications we need within the systems that are there? Because we still need engineers. Dr. Clark talks about this all the time. We still need people who make shoes. Think about something basic like that. A billion black people on earth. Imagine three or four countries decided to make all the shoes that we wore. How differently that would change the black economy. Because I know every single person in here, every single one, probably not one of us is wearing a pair of shoes made by an African person, right? Maybe one. Raise your hand if you've got shoes on that you know, you know are made by an African company. There you go. <laughs> no, no, I'm not even cussing. I'm not wearing them either. Because I don't know if they exist. Right? So the point is very basic things that we need to learn that take in even the racialized education that we need, the education that we need to survive racism, to combat white supremacy, the education we need for activism, even removing that for a moment, our kids need to learn how to make shoes, how to design cars, how to build houses, how to farm. All these practical things are things that we need to learn. Of course, this education system is not going to teach them because it doesn't even teach it to working class white kids. Because this country was not designed for the majority of the population to have a stake in the way the country is run. So if we think we're suddenly going to get educated in how to run a country, it's a bit ridiculous. That's not what's going to happen. So how do we transmit those skills with all the other challenges we've got? I don't have the answers. But I think it's a challenge we can meet and we have met before. I think sometimes, again, when we talk about this history, we can forget the victories. Formal Western colonialism was designed to last centuries. 
it lasted barely 70 years. It was a total failure because of our resistance. Transatlantic slavery was not supposed to end because William Wilberforce sent a, partition, a, a petition to Westminster. Without the Haitian Revolution, without the Maroons, without consistent, visceral bloodshed and struggle, there's no reason to believe they would suddenly said, all this wealth and power is just spoiling, I'm just going to give it up. There's no reason to believe that. Even if we look at a country like Jamaica today and the relationship Britain has had since then with its former colonies, with Grenada, most of us have forgotten that Britain allowed a Commonwealth country to be bombed by America in the 1980s. This is the relationship Britain has with its former colonies. How do we give all of that, all of that equipment and all of those relationships you know, across continents, essentially? I don't know, I'd like to hear from you guys as well, but I just want to offer a few kind of closing uh, points. One little thing we need to resurrect, which I'm sure many people in here are already resurrecting, is partner. How many people are part of any kind of partner scenario in here? I mean, that's yeah. brothers and sisters. Yeah. In an audience like this, for five people, to tell me they're part of a part. Does everyone know what partner is? Yes. Raise your hand if you don't know what partner is. Okay, so quite a few people. So partner was a system, I'll, I'll explain. Partner was a system of cooperative economics that our grandparents mostly practiced where they would save up money together. So say it's a partner join, it's 100 pound. There might be 50 of us. We put in, we put in 100 pound a month and each person gets to draw a different part of the month. This is where a lot of people bought their houses. Now I'm part of a partner, but we don't take draw out of it. It's just money that we save and we don't actually know what we're doing with it yet. And, and that's okay. It's a Pan-African group. We save money together. When something arises that we think is sensible to put that money into, we'll do it, right? Now, I'm not, you know, it's not a whole load of money. I'm not acting like there's millions sitting in the bank. It's not, right? It certainly isn't. The point is, even if it's a 10 pound a month, don't leave Yasser and at least five of you ain't formed a group together. There's five of you that live in a certain part of Manchester, cool, set up a little bank account, put a 10 pound a month in, because you don't know what five, 10 years that will accumulate, and all of a sudden, oh, a piece of land's come off and gone. Or this has come up there, or a school, a black school is going out of business. It needs a piece of money. We're not ready, we're not prepared, we don't have a cooperative source of economics we can draw on. And in an audience like this, that's tremendously important. The point I made about, at the beginning about the charity and the NGO sectors, I think whether we like it or not, those sectors currently exist. And they're not going anywhere for now. I would prefer to see, if I'm honest, conscious black people taking some role, even if they don't believe in the organizations. There's conscious black people that work at the BBC. I've done work for the BBC. Or for Sky News, I don't like Rupert Murdoch. But if Sky offered me a position, not within the organization, because I wouldn't work for him, but I've done documentaries where I'm putting forward a position that I'm happy with. And if that's in there, cool. If, you're gonna, if platforms are offered to you that you're comfortable with, it's better that some of us are going back home and telling the real story of what it's like to live in this part of the world than they keep getting the same old tired, England's wonderful, America's wonderful, everyone's just bogling and sun dancing. So there might be a career to think about where you can do some damage and you know, obviously even the fact of seeing a black face, yeah. being the person who's, who's in a position of giving. Because even that, the culture of only ever seeing white people come to give for you. What does that tell? And like I said, whether we like it or not, these sectors are not going in it anyway. So what our brothers and sisters are being taught is the only people who care about them are white people. Of course, we know that's not true, but how do we combat that? We may have to use some levers of power that we don't necessarily fully agree with to get our point across. That may be something to educate. Manage disagreements, yeah? I think one thing we always have, and I'm sure you've had it organized in this conference, right? Is where we have a problem disagreeing and working towards a common aim. I could disagree with you on, Religion, I could disagree with you on economics, but if I can find us something we agree on, cool, let's work in that, and we won't work about the other stuff. Yeah. And we might even disagree so vehemently, I'm just like, I'm not even gonna chat to my man about religion, because otherwise it's just gonna get like that, yeah? Because we disagree so strongly, fine. Like this idea, like I said, this kind of romantic idea, I think one of the big things we need to do, even in the conscious community, is kill the romanticism. We weren't all kings and queens, and I'll keep repeating it, we were not. Particularly those of us that ended up in the Caribbean, we were probably servants and farmers, and that's fine. Because Africa was not a class-free paradise where everyone just got along, and that's okay. We don't have to be perfect. We can disagree, we can not all be on the same page, and that's fine. We've got one particular massive problem that we need to deal with that's affecting everybody. And even when that problem is done, everything's not going to be perfect. But how do we strategize around defeating this particular problem that's affecting all of us if we respect one another? Yeah? And that can involve disagreeing. In fact, it should involve disagreeing. But it shouldn't, disagreements should not prevent us from working together, and we've got to learn. Who got Garvey evicted out of America? Yeah? All right, the FBI and them, and they might have been involved, <laughs> but who played into allowing one of our greatest leaders to be removed from the country? People who disagreed with him and were not willing to say, I disagree with my man, but I'm going to put my ego aside 
Because if the, if the vast majority of black workers are behind Garvey and pro-black worker, it don't work like that. If six million black workers are behind Garvey, I can't possibly be against them and be for their interests. I must be for someone else's interests, right? So I can have my disagreements with someone and say, you know, you man exist, hold your space, do your thing. I disagree on X, Y, and Z, and that's why I can't be part of that. But you know what? If it leads to the end goal, if it leads to some form of liberation, fantastic, wonderful, we can all cheer, yeah? So manage disagreements, work into a purpose. Trouble traces. And again, I'm probably preaching to the wrong room, but I, I, when I was in Zimbabwe, when I posted on my, uh, on my Twitter, on my Instagram, I don't know if you've been to Harare, but Harare is a beautiful city. Like a real nice city. Jacaranda trees everywhere, good roads, skyscrapers, hotels. It's a modern city, yeah? And when you post these pictures online, even my grandma, I love my grandma, but my grandma was like, you can't go Zimbabwe, dangerous. <laughs> and I was like, I was like, man, you're from Jamaica. <laughs> like, I love Jamaica, yeah? I love Jamaica, but let's be real. We've had the top, we've been in the top 10 for murder rate for about the last four decades. So let's just be honest, Zimbabwe is nowhere near as dangerous as Jamaica, right? But yet my grandma believes, you know, she can't, you know, I love her, but, but I think she's symptomatic of some of the colonial propaganda that still hangs over. She doesn't understand why I'm interested in Africa. You love Africa, ain't it? Like, it's curious though. She was like, she's like, why? I can't figure it out, right? But our travel choices, you know, when we can, we should be going to the continent or to the Caribbean. I mean, most of us, if we're from the Caribbean, we're going to go back to where we came from. But can we go to other Caribbean islands once in a while, mix it up? Can we go to particular festivals? Can we go and holiday, not just for work purposes? Or that? Can we start? We can't be cussing other groups of people who are scared to go to Africa, and we're scared to go. Where do we pick our holiday destinations? What do we do? And I know they've deliberately triangulated all the flat paths. So if you want to get to Zimbabwe, then you've got to go to South Africa first. Or if you want to go to a French-speaking African country, you've got to go to Paris first. I get all of that. I get the prohibitive costs. But can we be engaged in something like that? Can we be critical? Again, coming back to that point, I think it's really key. And maybe it's just because I'm a little bit older and a little bit less romantic but I feel than I was before. But I feel like criticism is the only way forward. In the sense that... If I, I haven't got any children, if I've got a child, right, and I'm never critical of that child, what's going to happen to the youth? As I say, spare the rod, spoil the child. So we can look at our post-independence leaders and say, what did they do fantastically well that we can learn from? But where did they fail? And it's okay. Kwame Nkrumah is a human being. He's going to make mistakes. Muhammad Ali was a human being. He's going to make mistakes. And it's okay to say, you know what, this is what you did fantastically well, but actually, this is what we can learn from some of the mistakes that were made, and this is where it's okay to be critical. Yeah? So I think all of those spaces, being critical, exchange, um, recognising the reality of the situation, there's no justice without power. Deciding on economics, I think the debate is still out. Is Walter Rodney correct? Does Africa itself need to divorce completely from the Westphalian nation-state capitalist system and form something completely new? And if that is the case, which many of us maybe believe is to be the case, what do we do in the interim? How do we, under a system that is not controlled at all, in any way, shape or form, by our people or our interests. How do we cooperate within that system to build towards a system that's completely different? And is that even possible? I genuinely don't have the answer. So I kind of would like to leave you pondering those questions and just open up and have a discussion. Like I said, not questions for me, it can be a question if you have one. But open up to a discussion about literally practical solutions that we can come to here today about education, things that we can do, little strategies we can put together from this room that we can take forward. Thank you very much, brothers and sisters.